stood beside him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And you may be seated. Genesis 28.10 God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. That statement from 1 Corinthians about God's decision-making ability gets to the heart of one of faith's most important affirmations. That is that God does not play by our rules because God has a habit of calling people that we see as losers and outcasts to do the most amazing things for God's kingdom. Noah wasn't a successful boat maker when God told him to get to work. Abraham and Sarah were unsure, uncertain about their own futures when God said that from them a great nation would spring. And the Israelites needed, when they needed someone to plead their case before their oppressive slave masters in Egypt, God sent a stuttering fugitive named Moses to lead them to the promised land. God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing the things that are, so that we might not boast in the presence of God. Throughout the scriptures, we see the same refrain repeated. You can call it God's upside-down kingdom. You could call it the divine reversal. But whenever it comes to putting people in positions of authority and leadership, God certainly sees things and does things differently than your average director of human resources. It's a different perspective that God brings to the mix. That brings us to that important story of Jacob there in the book of Genesis to be read. I felt as we wrap up this season of dreams, it would be nice to look at this great dreamer that we remember from the scripture. The picture painted of Jacob in the Bible, though, in that first book, is not one of someone we might be, who we would expect to be destined for greatness. A career in crime, maybe, a source of a great deal of heartache for his family, without a doubt. But greatness, that's not something we would normally think of as we read the story of Jacob. The scripture tells us that he entered into the world holding on to his twin brother's ankle, and that that kind of set the stage for everything else that followed. Through his cleverness, through his blatant deceit, Jacob took from Esau, his brother, his due as the firstborn son, stooping so low as to even disguise himself to trick his elderly father, even invoking the name of God to perpetrate a great lie and fraud. Jacob tore his family apart, and as his story unfolds, we find and discover him to be one of the most unlikable people you'll find anywhere in the Bible. We, as we learn their story, find ourselves siding with Esau. We do not like Jacob. There is nothing about him that's an admirable. If you read the story and imagine meeting someone like Jacob on the street, you would not want to meet someone like Jacob on the street. That's what sets the stage for this story we read today, where because of his father is out of the way, Esau has finally decided it's time to turn the tables on Jacob, really to come after him, maybe even to take his own life. Jacob's on the move. And when we find him there in Genesis 28, he's at such a low and miserable point that he's kind of lost in this wilderness. And he pulls out even a rock from the ground to lay his head on. And we kind of like that. We're okay with that. This guy who's been such a fraud, who's been such a liar, the idea that he's alone in the wilderness with the sounds of growling and all kinds of craziness around him, having to lay his head on a rock for a pillow, we're kind of okay with that. That seems good to us. But that's not what God had in store for yeah. Jacob. Jacob, that night, with his head on a stone, dreamed that there was a ladder set up on the earth, the top of it reaching to heaven, and the angels ascending and descending upon it. And in the midst of that dream, he sees the Lord God himself standing beside him, and he declares that he is the Lord, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and says that the land on which Jacob was 
sleeping that night would be given to him and his offspring. And you will know that I am with you, said the Lord, and I will keep you wherever you go. And I'll bring you back to this place where I will not leave you until I have done with you what I have promised. Mm. The powerful promise of God that we find there in the scriptures. This powerful promise, no doubt. But it's also powerful in the one God makes this promise to. It's true that actually when we read Jacob's story, the only time before this moment you see him invoking the name of God is when he's lying to his father. We've seen no praise in his heart, no goodwill in his heart. But God still has something in store for him. God said, I will put this great promise before you. And if you will walk with me, that past can be wiped clean. You can be transformed to become an agent for something good, something promising, something life-affirming, something divine. This dream you have can come true if you walk in the promises that God sets before you. What was God thinking, we have to ask? What was God thinking that he would make this promise to this scoundrel named Jacob? Well, what God was thinking was that no one is beyond the grasp of love's reach. What God was thinking is that there's no such thing as a lost cause when it comes to the work of grace. What God was thinking was that there is a power, that God is the power that can bring about that change and transformation. Even to a scoundrel like Jacob, even to someone who's had their heart bent on destruction, God can do something powerful and good and bring about something affirming, bring about something loving, bring about something transformative where there's only been ruin and decay in the past. And you know what happens when Jacob wakes up that next morning? He sees things in a whole new light. His declaration that morning is surely the Lord is in this place. He saw that ladder and he realized that much more than the angels descending and ascending and descending on that ladder, it was his opportunity to get up into a new day that God had given him, to walk in a new path that God set before him, to live in a different way than he had before. Even though Jacob's desire to steal his brother's blessings had nearly destroyed his family, Jacob was still God's choice to be the blessing, the agent of blessing for every family in the world. Because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Jacob had become a citizen of God's upside-down kingdom. He woke up and he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, the gate of heaven. The last thing that Jacob had ever expected had taken place. That stone pillow on which he rested his head that night had become the monument, the memorial of God's favor, of God's presence in the midst of his darkness. And that's the funny thing about this God we worship. Perhaps you've experienced that too. Perhaps you can relate to the one who's had their heart bent on destruction. Perhaps you know too that it's not about your own greatness or goodness that reserves a place for you in this great kingdom of God, but that it is this powerful, amazing grace, this gracious God who calls us to worship, to serve, and to love. Just when we're about to revolt because of the favor God would show a scoundrel like Jacob. Just when we're about to walk away of the one whose ways call into question so many of the priorities that we might hold. We catch a glimpse, or we hear a good word, or we trip over a stone left by some other faithful pilgrim, and we remember, thanks be to God for God's scoundrel-loving ways, because if God didn't love a scoundrel, who would love me? This foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For some design signs and some desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block, foolishness, but to those who are called, all who are called, it is the power of God wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's wisdom is stronger. God's weakness is stronger than all our strength. And that is why we call this message good news for all people. Thanks be to God.